Mr. Potter lived quietly by himself. At the back of his house, there was a garden where nettles, cow parsley and tall foxgloves grew thickly in the shade. Mr. Potter was not very interested in weeding. At the end of the garden was a shed, but there were no rakes, spades or oil cans in it because Mr. Potter kept something much more important in there. Right, if you go farther down and see the allotments lower down, they're, they're all overgrown and uh, at least we keep them tidy. You know, the, the grass is mown and the lofts are presentable. I'd had pigeons when I was at school and just starting work, but I'd never raced them. I just used to take them to work with me and let them go and let them fly all. And some of those, it took them two days to get home. <laughs> and it was only seven miles. <laughs> One Friday evening, Mr Potter walked slowly down the brick path to his shed. He often went there when the garden was falling still and told the pigeon about the things that were in his mind. I suppose the pigeons helped me, really. When I was living, I was actually working, so I used to be up at five o'clock and down at the pigeons before seven, because I had to let them out, feed them, and obviously go to work. The problems we had, and I can see it from her point of view, is I always had to get back to feed the birds at a certain time. She didn't really, <laughs> she didn't really agree with that, like, but I had no choice. I've got to go and see to me birds. Mr Potter was longing for his pigeon to win, but she was young and the others were fast. And every pigeon, he said, does not win the race. Well, it changes winter to summer. Obviously in summer I go down earlier, but in winter I get to the pen about nine o'clock and it takes me a couple of hours cleaning out, feeding, changing the water, letting some out and just generally sorting everything out. That night, the moon was full and bright. Mr. Potter was sitting safe in his kitchen. Over by the shed, the tall leaves of the iris bed rustled mysteriously. It was Lupin, the cat from next door. Without a sound, he slid into the shed where Mr. Potter's pigeon was asleep. His claws caught the metal latch. The door sprang open and Mr. Potter's pigeon awoke with a start. She rose high above the village and the moon seemed bright and close. There was a sharp taste in the air, and she heard a low whispering sound. It was the sea. If you've got livestock, you've got to see to them every day, 365 days a year, like, you know. Uh, in winter, I only go once a day. In summer, I'll go twice. You can outfly a sparrow, uh, but a peregrine, no. Uh, they might dive in a wood or somewhere and it, it terrifies them and they, they might not come out for days before they'll, they even come out, you know. On a rock, surrounded by foam and roaring waves, stood a tall lighthouse. The tired pigeon dropped out of the sky like a soft stone onto a narrow window ledge and fell asleep. Mr Potter's pigeon awoke before dawn and a bitter wind blew around the lighthouse. She looked out at the sea. The waves were empty, except for a small black fishing boat on its way home. She looked towards the land, and the hills rose comfortingly, with trees and church spires pointing to the village where she belonged. That was enough. As the sun rose, she left the lighthouse behind her and set off to find the way home to Mr Potter. On the day of the race, Mr. Potter got up at five o'clock and put his pigeon into a wicker travelling basket. Some are hundreds of thousands of pounds. I think the money men have got into the game, you know, to me it's just an hobby. I can afford to buy one of these supposedly top pigeons. If you're winning an England race, it's 30 pounds. A channel race can be 100 pounds for first prize. But if you're paying hundreds of thousands of pigeon, uh, pounds for a pigeon. You need to win a lot of 30 quid to get it back. When everything was ready, the race began. Mr Potter's pigeon flew out of her basket, but to her surprise, she found that a thick grey fog was hiding the countryside below her. On every side, she saw the confused shapes of the other pigeons flying in all directions. Then something white glistened nearby. She nearly fell out of the sky with surprise. 
There was the lighthouse where she had slept, ghostly and familiar in the fog. Now she knew exactly which way to go. You look uh, at the feathers and the, the droppings, you look down the throat and you, you can tell if a pigeon's ill. It doesn't look right. You can tell when somebody's ill, can't you, when you look at them and it's the same with a pigeon. Mr Potter sat waiting in his kitchen. Hours passed and the rain went on falling and the sky was still empty as Mr Potter finished his fifth cup of tea. Well, I was just going through the motions really. Praying and my mother, you know, but at least they gave me some, something to do, you know. Mr Potter ran outside and his pigeon flew gently into his waiting hands. My beauty, he murmured. I just do what I want now, you know. You know, I mean, I had to take it into consideration with, with some of it, but I still had to do my birds. And, you know, she, she would, I didn't have a problem with her, to be honest with you. Um, no, there weren't a problem with her. It's quite lucky that way, you know. It's not like them pigeons and me, and she would have had to go. <laughs> <laughs> and then all the pigeons that had been lost in the fog came tumbling out from behind the clouds. They had followed Mr Potter's pigeon home. On and on they came, until the pens were a rustling carpet of grey feathers and the air was filled with soft voices. So Mr Potter's pigeon came home first and won the race. Mr Potter laughed and said, who would have thought it? And who would?